Good morning. Now I have to preach, but I'm already thinking about what we're going to be having downstairs. I never had that problem until I came to Grace. Now, we had men's fellowship this last Friday. We had tapioca pudding with raspberries, um, and then we had some uh, cool whip. And men's fellowship is coming again this Friday, and I'm thinking, what are we having this Friday? It's just amazing. We're known for our praying and our eating delicious uh, tasties. Bake sale. When's the next bake sale? Let's open up our Bibles to James chapter 5, 19 through 20. James 5, 19 through 20. One of the best kept secrets in this church is that Brother Sterling is a tremendous cook. His breakfasts are amazing. James 5, 19 through 20. It reads, Brethren, I am speaking now to the whole congregation again. To all the saints, to everyone sitting in the church, whether you be clergy or laity, he's speaking to us all. This includes everybody, leadership and membership. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converted the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. Today's message is the combative praying process. Let's pray. Dear God and Heavenly Father, again we approach you as Sister Linda was teaching. We approach you for help. You are our help. There is no help in us. There is no inherent good in us. We have no power. We are powerless. But we turn to you, Almighty God, that you might bless us this morning with your word. Bless us with your truth and sanctify us with your truth. Thy word is truth. Bless us, O God, we pray. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen, Lord, and amen. Last week I spoke to you about the scripture praying prophet. We talked about how Elijah, when he prayed and was asking God to turn the wicked nation around, found in scripture three alternatives for so doing. It's there in the sermon outline. If you look there, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses 12 through 13, lays out what God said he would do. I will give you three choices. I will shut up the heaven that there be no rain, or I can command the locusts to devour the land, or I can send pestilence, a plague, among my people. I, the Lord, will do it. I, God, will do it as a means of disciplining my covenant people who have broken covenant with me. So Elijah prays the first alternative. And God shuts the heavens for three and a half years. 
when God confirmed to Elijah that he was going to do exactly as Elijah had prayed because he was praying scripture, then Elijah was dispatched to King Ahab and said to him in 1 Kings 17, 1, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. So, now we turn to 1 Kings 18, 19 through 40. And this is where the battle comes in. This is where Elijah shifts from a praying prophet, a scripture praying prophet, to a combative praying prophet. Pastors, I can tell you, pastors do not want to be combative. We don't. But we're forced to. Whenever the church goes sideways, pastors must get combative. So, look at the text, 1 Kings 18, 21. And Elijah, this is now, this is after three years of the heavens being shut up. And Elijah came unto all the people, referring to the people of God, and said, How long shall thou be between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal be God, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. Why was Elijah so upset? Well, if you look at your introduction, he was upset because there is what we call, among the people of God, theological syncretism. This was embedded in the minds of God's people. What is syncretism? Syncretism is the combining of different religions, different cultural practices, and the combining of schools of thought. We expect the world to be confused. We expect the people who are not in covenant with God to get everything wrong about God and life. But we don't expect that among God's people. God's people are disciples of Christ. We are students of the Word. This entire book contains truth. And this truth leads to God and to eternal life. Sadly, when you look at churches and what they preach and what they teach and what they practice, there is syncretism in the camp. There are things in the church today that people practice, that preachers say, that prophets do in the church, which just tells you they are combining Bible with New Age thought. They have new age prayers. They even bring witchcraft into the church. This is syncretism. And this would bother a Daniel. It would bother an Elijah. It would bother an Isaiah. It would bother a Jeremiah. Because those individuals were men of the word of God. And if you study the word, and if you rightly divide the word, you will always come to the right conclusion. If you rightly divide the word, you will rightly come to the right conclusion. Right always leads to right. And so, Elijah is beside himself. He comes to the people, and this is his first sermon to the people. How can it be that you have God and Baal on the same level. How can you have God and Satan on the same level? How can you think that Satan is God 
And how can you think that God is saying? Well, this is the mindset of the church today. Listen to the church's music. Go to a pastor's conference and listen to the pastors who are teaching at the conference. Listen to them and you'll understand there is syncretism in the church. And since there is syncretism, God has departed. Ichabod is stamped all over the church because the church has departed from truth. In the church today, we have religious, ecclesiastical combining. What are, what are we combining? What have we allowed to combine? Well, there's a dangerous combination, there's a dangerous mixture of the doctrines of the Bible. But in addition to those doctrines of the Bible, now we have come up with the teachings, the commandments, and the doctrines of men. Which change every decade. People who believed something in the 1960s, denominations who believed certain things about Christ in the 1960s, have changed their views. Not because the Bible has changed, but because the men purporting those views, they have changed. Mankind is always changing, always on a downgrade, always going from bad to worse. This is why we have to anchor ourselves to the timeless Word of God. So, you have the doctrines of men, and then you also have sprinkled with doctrines of demons. Every time I sit down with my colleagues and we're having coffee and they start spouting some new age thought, I say to them, can you give me a Bible verse for that? They can't. It's always something that they heard at a conference or something that the Lord told them by revelation. Nonsense. We are to be tethered to the word of God and nothing else. John says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirit. When someone's talking to you, when somebody's telling you this is of God, you have to put them to the test. Where can you find that in the Bible? And if they can't give you a text, you take that and you throw it away. You are to test them by the word of God. You are to try the spirits to see whether they be sent of God or not. For many false prophets are gone out into the world. The church is choking on syncretism. It's all over the place. And it grieves me to see so many people spouting foolishness. Saying, God told me, or uh, uh, the Lord revealed this to me, and none of it is based on scripture. It's all based on emotion or some experience that cannot be backed by the word of God. So, Elijah comes on the scene, and he sees that this has taken place among the people of God. So look at Roman number number one. Elijah gets combative. He's polemical. To be polemical is to pick fights. Elijah, being inspired by the Holy Spirit, says to Ahab, listen, I want you to get the 400 prophets of Baal and the 450 prophets of the grove, now that's 850 prophets against one, he says, I want you to bring them to this glorious debate that we're going to have. We're going to have a showdown. Elijah says, it's time to have a showdown to see whose God is God. He picks the fight because God has had enough. 
And God wants his honor restored. You look at our churches today. They're empty. If they're not empty, they're in disarray. If they're not in disarray, the leaders and the members are at each other's throats. If it's not that, they've allowed everything to come into the house of God. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ around the world is a mess. And it's time to have a showdown. It's time to call for a contest. Whose God is God? That's what, that's what Elijah wants to bring to the fore. Whose God is God? So, turn with me to 1 Kings 18.24. 1 Kings 18.24. How do we settle the contest? And this is what the text says. Are you all there? Because this is how we settle every contest. And this is why I'm telling you, many of you are going to find me boring. Because I only have a plan A for Grace Church. And if people say, well, Pastor, do you have a plan B? And I told you my plan B is the same as plan A. And if that doesn't seem to work, if you come to me and say, Pastor, what's your plan C? It's the same as plan A. We're going, because listen to the text. Elijah said, and call ye on the name of your gods. That phrase, call ye, in other words, he says, I want you to pray to your God. And I will call on the name of the Lord. See, it's a prayer contest. It's not a singing contest. It's not a praise and worship contest. It's not a preaching contest. It's not a teaching contest. It's not a book writing contest. It's not to find out who's on the New York Times bestsellers list. It's a prayer contest. You call on your God, and I will call on my God, and the God that answers by fire, he is God. My brothers and sisters, listen to me. Everything goes right back to prayer. It's simple. God will bless Grace Church as we continue to do what we've been doing since the first Tuesday in January. We have been humbling ourselves before the Lord, crying out for his mercy, and asking him to do what we cannot do. Elijah said, this is a prayer contest. So he said, I'm going to let you guys have a head start first. And he let them have a head start. And 800, they, I mean, they had a massive group of intercessors crying out to Baal. And no answer. So Elijah said, well, I guess it's my turn now. You guys have been at this for three hours. You've been, you, you, your prayer meeting has been going on for hours. It's my turn. He says, go get 12 buckets of water. And I want you to douse the sacrifice. Because when you douse something, it's hard to light it up. He says, I want to show you that my God is God. Go get 12 buckets of water. That was the sacrifice. And when they did that, he stepped back and he said a simple prayer. And fire came down from heaven. He didn't, listen, he didn't pray a half hour. He didn't have to work up a prayer. He didn't have to sweat. All he did was, in a very monotone voice, now God, do your thing. You are the God that hears and answers prayer. And fire came down. Remember when we studied about the when Solomon dedicated the temple, that one of the non-verbal actions of God was that he sent down fire from heaven to, to assume the sacrifice. 
Well, that's the God. You see, Elijah knows scripture. He knows how God operates. And so he says, you did it for Solomon, you'll do it for me. God hears and answers prayer. How are we going to beat the world at their game? On Sundays, listen to me. There's competition between the church and the world. You got football, baseball, basketball, hockey. Not just on television. We got that stuff right here in our town. Where people don't come to church because they're running around on Sundays doing and involved in numerous activities that take them away from God. You can't compete with that. I don't care what kind of musicians you have in here, what kind of singers you have in here, what kind of preacher you have in here, that won't attract them. The one thing that will draw them is God. Jesus said, unless the Father draw them, they will not come. And how do we get the Father to draw them? By praying. Well, we have this kind of a preacher, or we have this kind of a pastor. That won't draw flies. It won't. Only God can supernaturally draw. Only God can send down fire from heaven. Only God can baptize his church with the Holy Spirit. So, the contest is over. Now let's go to James. As we conclude, James 5. James, who's already got us tied into Elijah, remember, we've been studying Elijah and James. He concludes his book, his epistle, by telling us, listen, you now are going to do the same thing Elijah did. And he's not saying, he's not saying this to the pastors, he's saying this to the brethren. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one converted, what was the whole mission of Elijah? To take a nation that had gotten off God's path, the path of truth, they were following a path of error. And Elijah was sent by God to convert them or to turn them around. Now there's two conversions. You're converted to Christ. You're born again. You come to the Lord. You turn from your sinful ways. But then in your Christian life, Satan tries to not take you away from the Lord, but he tries to take you away from the truth. Bible truth. Gospel truth. And so James says, there might just be some of you who have got caught up with bad doctrine. Whether it be the doctrines of men or the doctrines of demons, whether it's a synchronization of a little bit of God, a little bit of the demonic, a little bit of human, whatever, whatever the combination is, you're off. You're not following the path of truth. He says, now brethren, if some of you have gone down that path and one, and all you need is one, all you need is one person to say, hey, let's sit down. Let's have coffee. I heard you say this. Let me, let's open the Bible. Let's reason together. Why are you spouting that New Age teaching? Where did you get that from? If you're able to take that person and convert him, and again, it's not salvation conversion, it's theological conversion. If you convert him, turn him around, because he's headed down the path of destruction. That's what Elijah did for a whole nation. He prayed and turned a nation around. Let him know. Let the person who's involved in that kind of soul winning, that he which turned or converted the sinner from the error of his way, will save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. Bad theology, bad living. If you have the wrong God, if you have the wrong concept of God, 
you're going to have wrong living. Wrong living produces sins. So if we get you back on track with God, the sinning stops because the wrong thinking stops. And so, so James says, listen, you got to be a little Elijah. Maybe you can't turn a whole nation around at a time, but just try to turn one around. The last verse here, as I conclude, reads, and this is point number two, Elijah the combative political prophet that converted, turned God's people around from the error of their way. Let's read that. Then fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering. And not, now remember, that's after it would have been doused with all that water, making it nearly impossible to even strike a match or to start a fire and get it going. The fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and even consumed the stone and turned everything into a pile of ashes. The water, the water was licked up out of the trench and when the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they were no longer of two opinions. They said, we know definitely that the Lord, He is God. If we're going to turn things around, if people are going to find out if the Lord is God, it's prayer. It's asking God to show up and just do things people have never seen before. That's what we need. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks. We praise your name. Your word is so true. It always leads us back to that one thing that the church has given up on. It always leads us back to that one thing the church has rejected. The one thing the church hates to do. The one thing the church despises. And it is prayer. It is the humbling of ourselves. The confessing of our sins. The coming back to God. That bruises man's ego. But that's the only way. That's the only way to come to God, to let Him know that we know we're wrong and He's right. That's the starting point. Bless us, O oh God, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.